So I think we can start. It's about uh, more than 50 participants and active attendees. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Marta Zhuvic. I'm coming from University of Rijeka, Croatia, but I'm, I'm also a member of the steering committee of the EUA learning and teaching part. So I welcome you to the forum and welcome you to this breakout session P1 where we will be seeing uh, the topics on lessons learned from this pandemic situation to, that lasted already two years. So uh, I will be chairing this session in which I'm sure you, we, you will all enjoy the presentations on these challenges and solutions faced during the pandemic times. But also we expect you to participate actively in a discussion uh, which will follow the presentations. So let me remind you that all questions to the presenters can be addressed anytime using Q&A section, which is in upper right corner of your screen. Uh, but all other comments you can share uh, via chat. In Q&A sections, you can also uh, vote for post questions, therefore putting them higher on the priority list and uh, more likely to be answered uh, in a discussion part. So let us start, uh, as I said, already two years after the beginning of, of the pandemic times, uh, we are all struggling and still grappling with its ramifications while also reaping the benefits of new insights and good practices established. Uh, during this time. And uh, in this breakout session, we will host uh, one paper presentation and three practice presentation. So they come from four different universities across Europe. And the first on the floor will be Professor Carlos Delgado Clos, who is a vice president for strategy and digital education at Universitat Cal Carlos III de Madrid. Uh, he will be presenting uh, uh, the paper titled On-Site, Online, On-Point, A Contextual Approach. So let me just say a few words about Professor Delgado Clos. He holds a PhD in computer science from Technische Universität München in Germany and telecommunications engineering from Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. He's a full professor at the Department of Telematics Engineering of Universitat Caldo III, where he was uh, the founding director. He is presently, as I said, vice president, and uh, he is also director of the UNESCO Chair on Scalable Digital Education for All. He's also director, therefore, he is director of the GAST Research Group. He has many other functions and uh, his paper can be also reached in, uh, uh, on, on this platform, but I'm sure that we will more than this enjoy his live presentation given online. So, uh, dear Carlos or Professor Delgado, the floor is yours for next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so that everybody can see it. So uh, this is a joint paper uh, by Isabel Gutierrez, who's the vice director for studies and me. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here and honor. And let me share in these 20 minutes uh, what has happened at UC3M at Universidad de Colos de Madrid during the last years and some analysis and also some, some future of reflections for the future. So, Universidad Carlos III de Madrid is one of the 50 Spanish public research universities. Uh, we are among the best 50 universities under 50 years worldwide, uh, according to the US rankings, a lot of 50s there. There are around 20 something students, 21 or 22,000 students, uh, of which three fourths are undergraduates. It's important to uh, realize that we have three main schools one in social sciences and law, one in humanities, communication and library sciences, and one in engineering with many engineering disciplines. So we have these three main schools, which I will abbreviate with SOC, HUME and ENG. 
So what is the timeline in these two last years? Uh, so before the 10th of March 2020, we had the old normal. We had the normal on-site teaching. Then there's a second phase, which is lockdown, complete lockdown uh, under the pandemic, where all the teaching was brought online in an emergency. This was from the 11th of March until the summer 2020. Then there's a second phase where some teaching on site was allowed, but under uh, with limited presence, with uh, a distance and without allowing all students to be on at the same time on campus. And uh, this was last uh, academic year. And now we are in a uh, uncertain phase. We are uh, teaching basically on site, but you don't know what will happen when. Let me go through these three phases and uh, reflect on what we have been doing. So the old normal, or the, 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 how the teaching is organized is basically we have groups of 120 which go together uh, uh, to a lecture hall once a week. And uh, then we divide these 120 students maximum into three groups of maximum 40 students to have seminars, recitation, lab work, etc. And we will call this standard session. So for each subject of six ECTS, every student has one and a half hours or 100 minutes of lectures every week and 100 and 190, 100 minutes of small group uh, sessions. This is the organization here at UC3. Now let's go to phase one. In, within a week, we moved the whole university online. We did uh, teacher training. Where one, we have 2,000 uh, faculty members, basically, of, of all kinds of categories. And 1,500 uh, took this course, this teacher training, in order to adapt to the new situation. We have been using the conference systems we had before already, like Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and Google Meet. And we did a lot of uh, procurement in order to buy um, and um, infrastructure and enforce IT in communications. Fortunately, we had, as a result, zero system crashes, zero successful attacks, because there was a lot of, uh, in general, uh, cyber attacks all the time, and uh, zero performance problems. Phase two, which is last academic year, we had to, we could not bring all students on campus because there was a one and a half meters distance, which was compulsory. So our decision, which I think was quite unique, is to move the lectures online. We have the two, the standard sessions and the lecture sessions. The lecture sessions were online and the small groups, the standard sessions were on site. So we had the same experience for all the students. It is much easier to, for the professor to teach <coughs> either online or on site, but not so much in a mixed uh, environment where you have your students online and we have students on site where, where you maybe pay attention more, more to one uh, class of students than to the other. This implied a lot of organizational work because the small groups were put in the big lecture halls. So the number of students that fit in each of the rooms was different. So there was a lot of reorganization um, done in order to make this happen. Here's basically some of the tools we use, Blackboard Collaborate, Google Meet. We also have uh, WooClub, which is an engaging uh, platform for questions, for polls, etc. In class, we, we use uh, um, virtual boards like Jumbo and others, and we also taught our teachers to use to create videos with Kaltura. And this was all integrated in our enterprise resource plans. So this is basically, in summary, the phases we have gone through. Now, let us analyze what was the satisfaction of the students. Every year, we pass some questionnaires to students where there's a number of questions they have to reply on. And now for, for this analysis here, I will concentrate on two questions. The response goes from one to five in a Likert scale. Question A is, was this a good teaching? Did the teacher teach well? Did it stimulate learning? And question B is about the subject. Did you learn well? Was this good learning? Did your, your knowledge or competence and skills 
increase after the class. So these two questions we will concentrate on and see what was the responses by students in the different phases. Good teaching and good learning. Okay, let's consider on good teaching. Was the teacher good or not under on-site and online considerations? Here we have the responses, 355, for instance, go from one to five, as I said, the, uh, the average, the means, and the standard deviations for the lecture sessions and for the standard sessions for the three schools. During the uh, spring semester 19, spring semester 2020, and spring semester 2021 for each of the two kinds of, of session. We will analyze this in, in, the, in the minute, but you can see already here, for instance, 355, which was on site, to uh, 355 online. And uh, so it was increasing, but we will uh, analyze this uh, in a minute. So this was question A and the responses we got. And then was question B, was this good learning? Did you learn better? And here the response is exactly in the same way. Now let's analyze and let's compare the following. Let's first compare what was the reaction of students, the, the, the satisfaction of students when moving lectures and standard sessions from on-site to online under the pandemic. This was the, it will be the first comparison. Secondly, what was for standard sessions uh, the, the satisfaction when moving from online to on-site in 2020 to 21? Third comparison, what lectures stayed online uh, in this uh, in, in 2021? So what was uh, the satisfaction when moving lectures or, or leaving the lectures online where as the standard session were moved on site? And the fourth question is really standard sessions were on site before the pandemic and after the pandemic or the, or the, the recent uh, pandemic still uh, uh, there, but, but with uh, less Im implications. What was the direction there? So we have four questions, which go from the blue is on on uh, site and the and, and the red is online. So the first question is from on site to online. The second is from online to on site. The third is from online to online, and the fourth is on site to on site, from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one. Well, we see that there were improvements in the satisfaction of students for both questions in all schools, except for question A in humanities, uh, in, uh, in the moving, uh, still playing, leaving the lectures online, but the standard is becoming on-site. So there was no improvement here. And there was no improvement uh, from uh, in question B for the standard sessions before and after the pandemic on site. What is amazing, what is incredible, is that there was an improvement from the rest of the schools for so, uh, social sciences and engineering from 2019 to 2020, moving on site to online and moving uh, to, from 2020 to 21 where part of the uh, teaching was done on site. Let us reflect on this uh, three and these four analyses. From on site to online, there was a satisfaction improvement, possibly not due to the increase in teaching quality, maybe, but to the gratitude of the institution and its faculty to face this supervening situation. There was a tremendous effort for both faculty and students and even some faculty members report there's even more interaction because of the chat. People can intervene at any time and they could not do it before on site. They could not stop uh, the professor at every moment. So there were some advantages. There was an improvement in satisfaction. Secondly, from online to on site, social sciences engineering was also improvement. Basically, uh, the instructor support and help in learning was highly, highly valued. In social science engineering, the, the, the approach is basically more quantitative, whereas in humanities, maybe it's more qualitative. 
there maybe this was the reason for the difference thirdly from online to online in the lecture sessions there was a, there was a big effort in faculty training to teach how to use uh, digital tools and how to improve the teaching process online and i think this is reflected like very well here going from 2020 to 2021 the improvement of faculty training, where a lot of effort and investment was done, in which was followed by most of the instructions, instructors. Whereas in humanities, this was not uh, appreciated in the same way. And fourth, comparing on-site to on-site uh, on before and after the, the lockdown, uh, there was also an improvement because the training received by instructors to better face the online classes is being used in active learning and engagement on on-site session. So there was an improvement. I mean, there is a chasm to cross when using digital tools. And many professors were already using digital tools well. But the pandemic forced to bridge this chasm and teach better how to use the tools, which helped to have better classes. Now, let's... Uh, in the remaining seven minutes I have, let's look a little bit into the future. We have been, a, been doing a big uh, effort in improvement of platform and teaching spaces. And also we reinforce the teacher training unit, which is called UCM Digital. Uh, and in particular, we have, are making a big effort to make uh, teaching more active. My, my reflection is, are on-site and online really alternatives? Well, you can have online interaction even on-site. You can use the cloud, cloud-based tools as another, an additional place to meet. You can use, for instance, this is one of the master's uh, classroom, classrooms for, for master's programs, where we can have on-site students, we had remote students, uh in a hybrid way and i mean the 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 digital board was projected on on the screen for on-site students and uh, the remote students could follow this online but you can have also on-site students following and participating maybe in this blackboard using their uh, computer or even the smartphone this is an additional uh, advantage even for on-site students or you can use engagement tools like WooClub or Kahoot or Mentimeter or others both to ask questions to on remote students but also to on-site students so what should not uh, identify on-site and online as alternatives one should see online and remote as alternatives but what is really more important? Is it important to have on, on site or remote? Is this the big difference? Or is the interaction more important rather than the modality? Active and participatory education is even more important than whether you are on site or remote. We are now using in some courses, and we will be using in others, a tool called Engagely where on the one hand, you can have a digital uh, translation uh, virtual of the lecture hall, where you can see your uh, fellow students and you can see the professor with the content. But at the same time, you have tables in small breakout groups where students can talk to the fellow students in their table without disturbing the rest of the class. But in comparison to other tools like Zoom or Blackboard, etc., you can have both things at the same time without uh, clicking here and there. You can have lecture hall and listening to the professor while at the same time maybe asking your neighbor, okay, what did he say? You have lecture hall and breakout groups simultaneously. Moreover, you can have on-site and remote students also at the same time, you can have students with their mobile phones following and seeing the remote students over the computer and the remote students can participate uh, 
in the class uh, through the mic and um, video. So on-site and online are really not alternatives. On-site and remote are alternatives. But let me show you another thing that we have um, set up at our university, the telepresence classrooms. Here we have, uh, you can see here on, on the front part, the room in the Leganes campus. And on the wall, you can see projected on a person uh, size, the uh, image from another campus, which is five kilometers away. And both rooms are joined together digitally, making one amplified classroom. Is this really online? Is this on-site? Is this remote? Is the experience uh, an on-site experience, even if they're students uh, five kilometers away? Oh, in, in the University of East Finland, where they have the same room uh, 3,000 or 4,000 kilometers away. You can hear very well through these special microphones and, and, and speakers what is happening on the other side. So the experience is really uh, very like on site, even if they're students online. To finish, I like very much what uh, Phil Liebing, the CEO of, of the platform called mm -hmm, says. He talks about remixing reality, the digitification of the world, and that combining online and remote uh, tools, you are even better than in real life. And I would like to talk, or I would like to propose that this G DJ fights active education or remixed active education is really the, the way forward and the point to follow, rather than the dichotomy online versus on site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, uh, and dear Carlos. Uh, it was very interesting to see how uh, this proper uh, use of technology and good management can produce such a success. And uh, we are now uh, eager to see uh, what will you answer to the questions already posed in our Q&A. So I will be uh, repeating the uh, first question came from Maria Kelo and uh, she asks could student satisfaction with online learning be also influenced by their understanding of the difficulties uh, during this pandemic times or the difficult cir circumstances how do you comment on this yeah I think this uh, the the one of the first the, 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 the comparison number one no where there was an improvement in satisfaction, I think this was due to, to the efforts made by the whole institution in putting infrastructure, tools, and uh, resources available, and by the teachers themselves to really move to online. I think this was uh, uh, reflected in the questionnaire, and 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 uh, and, 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 and and because this was not all the same at all universities no? and, and i think uh, when they had uh, comparisons with friends or, or, or brothers and sisters etc uh, they saw that this big effort was really um, made and they expressed this in the satisfaction questionnaires yes thank you i see i, I can see that uh, or i uh, i i think that we all experienced such a, a large enthusiasm that uh, we were all in while pandemic and lockdown started and uh, everybody was uh, in for it because we expected uh, that it will last two or three months and uh, we were ready <laughs> to do uh, all our best possible uh, the teachers both and the students so that uh, later on uh, there there was this fatigue and uh, more and more we needed to invest uh, in order to get the satisfaction Okay, the second question comes from Gudrun Sandhofer, uh, and it is what was done particularly on institutional level to support teachers in this transition? Yeah, um, one big thing is to reinforce the unit to, to support teachers and to train teachers. So the, the were more, it was, there were more persons uh, there uh, to help uh, train teachers and to support them in the needs. We also, since we didn't have at, at the very end March, uh, 
uh, at the very moment this explosion came and and in or, or, or better in june we had to prepare for for the next academic year and uh, since we didn't have enough uh, personnel we invite invented the figure of ambassadors so this were uh, teachers professors who were more uh, who had more practice in online digital tools to help others uh, uh, so so we are organized some sessions to uh, uh, for peer to peer uh, learning among uh, faculty members then also of course there was a big investment in 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 digital boards in infrastructure in order to adapt uh, all the lecture halls uh, we had already but but uh, during the summer 19 they, they, we, we bought uh, everything we could uh, in in order to Im improve um, the, the the lecture halls no so but basically to me the most important thing is teacher training and and to show what is possible uh, sometimes uh, people come uh, with uh, mixed uh, uh, expectations but after that okay i didn't know i could do this okay how interesting and and so they internalize all the possibilities and then they find new ways of improving the teaching teacher training is the most important uh, aspect thank you the next question comes from Sebastian Suban. He says, uh, how should we deal with the fact that the students are less eager to participate when being online? Do we really think the better software will be the solution? Well, uh, it's not all, only tools. Tools help and help a lot. It's not the same use uh, using a, a tool with a few features than you have more features available. But the other one, the other important thing is methods and, and I think methodologies, active teaching uh, methods is what makes the difference. Uh, so I, I, my approach, even if it was on site, I think moving from more lecture based passive uh, teaching to more active makes a difference. So it's not just tools. Also, of course, you need tools, but more importantly, methods and attitudes of uh, organizing and teaching the class. Thank you. Uh, since I don't see any questions in Q&A, maybe I can pose one. <laughs> From institutional management perspective, I would like to know uh, how you develop this concept, uh, both of the research and the uh, implementation and the build-up of all uh, the change you managed to, to implement. Uh, uh, given this uncertainty from month to month, we were expecting the, the situation to be changed, to be back to normal. How did you manage to get this consensus on the institutional level that you all go in the same direction, that uh, everybody agrees to go, and it was a long to run? <laughs> well, I think uh, I'm very happy at this my university. And, and, and I think people are quite sensible, both students and faculty members, and they see the needs, no? and, and they see that we, uh, something must be done. No? I must also mention here my colleague Isabel Gutierrez, who is the Vice Director for Studies, so who has uh, also every, always very active and, 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 and pushes ideas to the whole uh, university. And uh, I think when you pose reasonable things, even if it's... Uh, um, with some effort, I think on the long run it is accepted, and and this is what has happened. You no, know? so so uh, there was a tremendous effort of the support staff. I mean, working uh, even on holidays in you know, order to set up everything, and and this is recognized by everyone also. Mm -hmm. No, so so if if you see that the whole organization is moving and and trying to give solutions, then. For instance, as a vice rector, normally you don't get uh, uh, letters of uh, uh, gratitude. Mm -hmm. You do things, and sometimes okay, okay, okay. If if you accept, if 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 you agree, you, you do it. If you don't agree, maybe you 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 protest. No, but I got uh, letters of gratitude from professors I didn't even know. I know very many, but but two thousand professors thanking. How did you do it? How 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 was this possible? And thank you very much for this. So, this was really amazing, no? and, and, and how uh, everybody at the institution really supported 
the, the effort done. Great story. Uh, now appeared some more questions. Uh, Christos Anagiotos asks, what was this main software that you used? The name? Um, well, at the very beginning, it was Blackboard and Google Meet uh, because we had this available there. No, I mean, of course, many people use Zoom and we could have used Zoom, but we this was used already and, and, and it was the easiest thing. Maybe it was, I don't know whether it was the most uh, correct uh, uh, decision, but this was available, this was known by faculty, and so it was immediately uh, possible to use it. Maybe on the long run, maybe you take other decisions. Now we have to take, take a decision to uh, have a more advanced tool like Engagely with, to support us with even more uh, advanced features. You know? So we have maybe jumped over from, from, uh, from Blackboard, which is more... Blackboard has less features, but it's very stable. It's very robust. It works. It always works. No, so uh, it has some advantages there. No, and now we have moved to a maybe more advanced and forward-looking uh, platform, which uh, is really at the beginning had some problems of, of working, but but now it's quite stable as well, and we're using it quite successfully uh, at, at some courses right now. Right. And as always, the best software is the one that you, you can use most of it. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, another question comes from Paul McSweeney, uh, and he's saying, we have returned to on-site teaching recently, but uh, have a COVID policy of recording and live streaming all face-to-face -face teaching. My worry is that the distinction between on-site and online is becoming blurred. Have you observed this also? I think you already... I mean, uh, there is one big difference, which is uh, student interaction. Uh, a, a student cannot interact uh, in a, a synchronous uh, viewing in the same way as in the class. So it's not being blurred. I think interaction, and this is the important thing, the, the interaction, not the modality, I think uh, is... Oh, did we lose Carlos? Well, it seems <clears throat> at least I can't see or hear Professor Delgado Clos anymore. Hopefully he will be uh, returning for the I, oh yes. Sorry, I disappeared. Oh. But I don't know what happens. So, so I, I'm connected with this cable, but sometimes uh, uh, this one is not so robust. <laughs> yes. Uh, what well, I was saying that uh, interaction is important, and it's not the same viewing asynchronously content than participating um, on on at, at the right moment and being able to interact with the professor. So it's not the same. Asynchronous online is not the same. Yes. So more important than the modality is the interaction. What, what I, what Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions and we'll take them no more. Uh, no more others. Uh, Gir Gunnarsson asks, do you have any suggestions on uh, how teacher training and support can be arranged to reach and support in the best possible way? There are many models, but... Uh, He's interested to hear if you have any observations and suggestions. I think you already maybe asked, answered this yeah. with just short summary. Yeah, I mean, so, so the very the red one is from the support staff to, to organize courses, uh, to, to support uh, uh, professors when they need it, maybe in a one-to-one -one, uh, mode. Uh, then we had these ambassadors, so peer, instructors uh, of, of uh, new ways which we applied uh, during june july in 19 uh, documentation available uh, so the different uh, ways but i think they're all well known okay also maria sutel asks what practices uh, will remain after these two years of online teaching and, and learning uh, in summary, what is your message to the teachers and students that can be uh, derived from the from your experience? I think more active uh, teaching, more participation of students, uh, uh, 
been by speaking or by using tools, participating, like we have here. You know, your yes, so, okay, and like if I may add in, in conclusions that obviously a good management of resources and good management of people uh, uh, and teacher preparation is, uh, uh, is a recipe for success. Yes, very true. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will be turning on now uh, our uh, practice presentations. So uh, our practice presentations will be given from three uh, universities. Uh, first will be thank University you. of... Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Uh, I, I hope you will stay with us also. So sure. the first one will be from University of Nicosia from Cyprus, the next one from Uppsala University, Sweden, and the third one from SWPS University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Poland. Uh, let's go to the first presentation, uh, which is titled From On-Site to Online in 120 Hours. The University of uh, Nicosia uh, responds to COVID pandemic. This presentation will be given by uh, Professor Mel Poyakovidu and uh, Professor Christos Angiotos. And the author of the paper is also Andri Vrioni from all from University of Nicosia. Let me introduce with a few words just our presenters. Um, professor Mel Poyakovidu <clears throat> is an assistant professor and director of the Academic Compliance Office at the University of Nicosia. She is also the head of Industry Liaison Office uh, and the member of the Senate. She serves a, shared, served as a member of International Internal sorry Internal Quality Assurance Committee uh, as the auditor and uh, Erasmus Institutional coordinator. There are more uh, important functions that she served, but let me also say a few words about uh, Dr. Christos Anagiotos, uh, who is the director of the e-learning pedagogical support unit and the director of the faculty professional development unit. He specializes in faculty training in the areas of adult and distance education with uh, a lot of experience in the in the field. Before joining this university, he held a position of assistant professor in the Department of Adult Education and Leadership Studies at North Carolina in the, in the United States. Uh, his experience also includes relevant positions at the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University and the University of Connecticut in the States. So I will pass the floor now. I think uh, Christos will be presenting first, but Melpo will be also joining. So uh, we are looking forward to your next seven minutes. The floor is yours. Okay, there. hi. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? And can you see the screen? Sure. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Christos Anayodos. Uh, as uh, mentioned by Marta, I am the director of the e-learning pedagogical support unit and under this role I will be presenting uh, this paper which was written along with my colleagues Mel Poyagovidu who is with us, uh, Andri Vrioni who was not able to join us and of course our uh, rector, the Professor Filipos uh, Boyutas, who also will not be able to, to be here. So it's a joint effort and we try to put this together uh, to present the case of the University of Nicosia and how we managed to, to move from uh, on-site to online. Uh, I see a lot of similarities uh, uh, for, for, to our case with uh, the previous case presented by uh, Professor Delgado. Um, and I'm glad it seems that there is some consistency in how universities uh, made that transition. Uh, although our presentation will be a little bit different focused. So the aim of the presentation, as I mentioned, is to share that experience because we found that uh, the transition for the University of Nicosia uh, seemed to be way smoother, let's say easier than other universities in Cyprus and other universities that we uh, have contact with. And uh, at the end, we will see our reflection and why th we think that was. Uh, and that was part of our uh, strategy for 
what's going on next in case we have something similar, etc. So we'll share with you our practices, challenges, successes, reflections, and the lessons learned. First, let me give you some background information about our university. Uh, the University of Nicosia, or UNIQUE, uh, has, uh, well, had 13,000 students at the time of the transition in 2020. Now we are a bit more than that. Uh, seven and a half thousand of those students were online before the COVID. So we have a very big distance learning, as we call it, uh, uh, section in the university where these students were um, t were, uh, lear were totally online. Many of them, most of them were abroad, very few students from Cyprus. Uh, and we also had uh, 5,500 students that studied face-to-face, -face, or as we call it at the University of Nicosia, conventional students that they go to class every day. So the main challenge here was how we move the almost half of the university, the 5,500 students online. So first, let me give you uh, some information about the software uh, we used before the pandemic. Uh, Moodle and WebEx were the main tools that we we're using in our uh, distance learning, the online courses. And uh, we stayed to those after the pandemic and during the transition for the reasons I mentioned before, because uh, the software you know are the best software to use. Um, so because we had the expertise in the software, we managed to make the transition, as we will see later, way more smoother. So now about the timeline uh, of, uh, of the transition. Uh, on March 10th, we got the uh, announcement that we had to move online the next day. It was late afternoon. I remember I was at the office. So from the day after, the March 11 until uh, March 15, March 16, we had to make the transition of all our face-to-face -face courses to go online. Uh, there were the decisions by the Senate and the Council of the University, and by March 16, which was a Monday, all teaching went online. Uh, now, what happened during that week, those five days mainly, uh, it was a week in the middle, but it didn't really matter at the time, as you all know. Um, so we had to inform all the faculty about the transition and explain the plan, and that was a job that was undertaken by the rector and the vice rectors. Uh, as you understand, and probably you experienced, there was some resistance from some of our faculty and students. We tried to explain it will be for a short period of time, which ended up being way longer than we expected also. Uh, we, we had to make sure that all faculty and students has access to the software needed. Yes, we did have WebEx, we did have Moodle and a lot of other software along with those, but uh, not everybody had access to those because not everybody was using them. So uh, for those of you who are dealing with uh, software, can get very expensive when you try to buy more licenses for this kind of software. They were not all available, etc. cetera. Um, to make sure that all faculty and students, and also in the infrastructure, right? To, sub to be able to support twice as many accounts on the same system, on the same servers. Uh, the third point here, make sure that all our faculty and students had the necessary hardware for online learning. Many of our staff had computers, for example, but they were desktop computers in their house. Uh, many of our face-to-face uh, students uh, didn't have the necessary equipment or the updated equipment to go online, so we had to find ways around that. Uh, and our IT team was working around the clock to make sure we bought enough hardware and disseminate those to the people who needed the most. Um, so uh, acquire the software for faculty and staff. And the last, which is, I think, extremely important, as I mentioned also in the previous session, offer training sessions on the use of all the software by our faculty. Uh, we were a bit ahead of other universities here because we were already offering uh, a lot of training to our faculty. Also, the fact that a lot of our face-to-face -face faculty were also teaching online. So they may be teaching one or two courses face-to-face -face and one or two courses online uh, because many of our programs are identical face-to-face -face and online also helped. But then we had a lot of people that uh, were not experts in using the software. And along with the fact that many many subjects are kind of difficult to be delivered online. For example, I remember many cases of physiotherapy and how we transition from there to from face to face to online. I will not say more to that because I know I don't have a lot of time and we can discuss that in the discussion later on.
So uh, we ended up uh, postponing the transit that 100% transition for a day. It was not on a ma on Monday. It went on Tuesday because there were way more challenges that we expected. So we switched online. If the, on the 17, we switched all our classes online, uh, including laboratory classes, and we find a lot of ways around. Uh, that our faculty were very innovative along with uh, our IT team, IT team and other uh, people uh, in the pedagogical support units. The students receive uh, the same number of teaching hours as per original face-to-face -face schedule. So if your class was every Friday uh, 10 to 12, your class would stay every Friday 10 to uh, 12, but it would be delivered online and that was for the face-to-face -face courses. Uh, their timetable did not change, uh, and the, there were makeup classes that needed to be done because from uh, March 11 to March 16, we didn't really deliver face-to-face -face classes until the, we were able to, to make the transition. So in short, during the spring 2020 semester, our 7,500 uh, distance learning students, online students, uh, were registered in 710 uh, online classes offered uh, online classes offered in 278 courses and delivered by 349 teaching staff. And as of uh, March 17, we transformed the remaining 5,500 face-to-face uh, students into online students. We offered online uh, 1,400 classes, 1,000 courses were taught, and 469 teaching staff were teaching online after that date. So. Then it came the time that uh, May and June was approaching and we were not going back to the university, so we had to find ways around assessment as well. And here is a, a table that shows all the different options that were given to our faculty. I will not stay to that. Uh, you have the presentation in case you want to go at your own time and read what were the different methods. Uh, we call that, uh, in short, we, we had take home exams, oral exams, uh, and uh, we also use Proctorio. Uh, here, this uh, tape, this uh, sorry, um, this chart shows the percentage of what we used. Uh, most of our faculty just decided to go with take-home assessment. This was a choice of our faculty and the departments in what method they would be doing instead of the traditional pen and paper exam in classroom because we were not able to do that. Uh, oral exams, proctorial exams, which is an online invigilating system, uh, and then special assessment involved like projects and other different uh, kinds of assessment. Here is some uh, data on the satisfaction of our faculty. Um, so the first question here is alternative methods of assessment were effective for assessing students. It seems that a lot of them said that it was yes, 87%. Uh, pedagogically, I prefer in the future to use alternative methods of assessment than final written exams. 53% said yes, 29% uh, said no. Uh, my preferred method of assessment is, it seems that face-to-face -face invigilated written examinations, the traditional way, uh, still was higher than uh, almost everything else. I learned the take-home exams, the fourth year in the row. Um, and... I know I'm close to running out of time. I have two more slides and I'm done. Thank you. So the elements that help the transition based on the reflection we did in some research, it seems that uh, we had a very well-crafted contingency plan, mainly designed by our, by our rector and vice rectors. Uh, the pedagogical and technical trainings offered to teaching staff before the pandemic were instrumental because they eliminated a lot of the training that was necessary. A lot of our faculty already knew how to teach online and use all this software. We had strong technical support teams that worked uh, long hours to support everybody, to make sure that everybody's computer was fine. Uh, expertise in online learning, as I mentioned, the university already had more of more, more than half of his student online. A lot of our faculty were teaching online and face-to-face, -face, so that made the transition way easier. And the use of flexible learning principles since 2019 was an idea that the pre the rec our rector introduced to the university and we're still working on that, but it seems that made us really flexible in adjusting. Uh, and in short here about the pedagogical and technical trainings, the, the main one 
We had a six, 36 hour seminar on teaching and learning, 12 weeks, three hours each, which 70% uh, of our faculty already completed by the time of the transition. So in this, we cover technical aspects along with uh, pedagogical aspects. So they had, they knew how to use and how to present themselves in front of the camera, how to use different software, uh, how to design pedagogically sound online courses and face-to-face -face courses. So that was instrumental. And then we have the technical trainings about Moodle, WebEx, and multimedia production, which was a third one, which was something that we pushed because of the pandemic, how to incorporate the video and multimedia in online courses. And that's it from me. I hope I was not rushing through the slides. It was a lot of material that I had to cover. Thank you. Thank you, Christos. Uh, Melpo, you need to continue something or uh, the presentation? Uh, no, no. We decided no, no. that Christos will hand, handle the entire presentation and we will be both available for Q&A. Great. Thank you, because our schedule is tight and I know, uh, we have I know. to proceed. No, no, we are done. Uh, it was really a nice presentation, uh, again, on success. Yes. And uh, I invite all the participants to pose the questions that we will be answering just after the all practice presentations are done. So I'll invite uh, our next presenter, uh, his Geir Gunlaugson from Uppsala University, and he will be presenting the uh, title presentation as pandemic reactions and long term impact on teaching and learning strategies interview-based study. Uh, Geir is the educational developer and has academic disciplinary background in business studies as teacher and researcher. He is a coordinator of international activities at the Unit for Academic Teaching and Learning, course facilitator for teaching staff training and consultative support for Uppsala University teachers and pedagogic leaders. Well, I will not go into uh, more of detail of uh, Geir's CV, but uh, uh, I will give you the floor, Geir. Welcome. And uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, a big hello um, to the audience, with many thanks that you decided to join us here this afternoon. Um, I represent uh, the, the educational developers here employed at Uppsala University as support staff for our teaching staff with our, with our role in um, supporting the development and delivery of, of high quality teaching and learning. Um, and I'm here together with my colleagues, uh, Susan Pathkiller and Mats Kuhlhead, um, both of whom are here in the audience and uh, work very much frontline people in the sort of dealing with the, the impact of the pandemic and, and then the follow up. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our observations from our work, um, both from the past, but maybe to the present and future. So run through that a bit quickly sorry. here together with you. Hello, sorry, this is Aurélie. Um, I'm yes. interested in just quickly, sorry about that. Your camera is kind of clicking. I know, I know, my camera. And we have a clicking. Yes, yeah. the light. Sorry about that. And it's not much I can do about it right now. And now it's... It seems it's going no. to it's regularly on and off. Okay, now it's it. gone. So don't touch oh. anything. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry for interrupting. No, it's okay. And get, please, uh, you can use your presentation mode so we can see the slides in larger yeah. format. Okay, this, all uh, right. I thought Aurelie had turned that on. I will run through this like this anyway. <laughs> can't see the button for that. Anyway, a little context. Um, Uppsala is, an, is a sort of fairly large university, 50,000 plus students based here in Uppsala. We've been here along the Firis River for quite some time, since 1477, um, spread out in, in several campus areas with our 60 departments, um, uh, with a small campus on the island of Gotland as well. And um, as you realize, this means that we have established us sort of physically quite clearly here with over measured sort of roughly 400,000 square meters of different types of facilities and, and other places of sort of learning spaces that we have developed over the years. And what happened, of course, was um, when the pandemic punched us as it did everybody else, we had to move very, very rapidly from the sort of more traditional learning spaces like our anatomical theaters and such on to 
the environment we're sitting in here today where we were sort of staring at each other on the TV screen and trying to figure out what to do and how to deal with this. Um, and after the initial wave where people were sort of grasping at the situation and trying to find solutions where we were very much engaged in supporting, we then decided that it would be good for us from our, our department's point of view to contact um, the representatives of the different departments and sort of check in and see where the, what has happened, where are you now? So we went out and contacted uh, pedagogical leaders from the 60 departments and received replies on basically asking what has happened, how have you met with this, what has worked, what has not worked, how are your students and teachers reacting? And we gathered considerable data regarding this um, and could combine that then with other input that we were having actively with our teaching staff in the interaction and of course with the student body as well. Uh, the first general impression we received was that things had actually gone surprisingly well, which was quite <laughs> pleasant for us to see that things were working to a point. Um, but this, of course, is a truth with, with several modifications. And when you started drilling into it, you could start sorting out specific aspects which were re relevant for us to sort of keep on when we were thinking about how to move forward. One of the first aspects was that we saw that there was a general sort of split and looking at what has worked and what has not worked. And this sort of is confirmed in other presentations you've already seen here and will probably be echoed further on during the day. But um, generally speaking from the departments they, and the disciplines, they saw that um, on the positive side, assessment had worked quite well. Um, that the attitude in general between colleagues, between teachers and students was cooperative, constructive, um, and that there was a sort of a problem solving attitude that generally that had established itself. That the systems that we had worked, that it was flexible and one could adapt, um, that there was recorded material and it could be added to. And that there was a lot of sort of space to meet, even if people were isolated in that sense. Um, but this was also seen as challenges, of course. The assessment was also seen as quite the challenge. And it was sort of channeled into various practical examples of this in practical sessions and on-the-job training. And of course, then the more sort of individual, physiological, mental challenges of Zoom fatigue and workload and isolation. So there was quite a broad response to this, which spread and, and, and demonstrated the pros and cons. We could see from the teaching examples that were pulled out, um, teachers saw that uh, and was reflected by the pedagogical leaders that um, there were things such as the silent lectures, the low interactions, which were said by some, which was counted by that others saw that there was actually more interaction, that um, seminars were mechanical, sort of going through the motions and difficult to get a lively, um, active discussion going, counted also by higher participation in discussion and easier to speak, weaker presence at, and at happenings, organized arrangements, compared to higher, expect, higher presentations, weak contact with students. So you see through this list that there was, there was quite mixed signals that were coming through um, and they were very balanced in that sense. It was sort of, you know, this, that, and, and there was not really, you could not say any specific discipline, perhaps some tendencies within some rather than others, but in the overall picture, it was sort of spread out that there were these general observations here or there in a balance. Um, which makes things interesting, but at the same time, a bit tricky to deal with. We could see, of course, there was a management perspective, and this was nothing new. This is an old management perspective, but it was still very present and sort of came up to the surface very clearly, this idea of unavoidable digitalization. digitalization. Where are we in this sort of adaptive curve? Are we missing the train? And could we do things better? And this important one about the effectiveness and efficacy of the quality of what was doing both in terms of teaching and learning and also in terms of work and work life. In the, on, the stu on the teacher's side, um, we saw these aspects of enthusiasm and interest. It was strong drive there, which teachers pulled out um, compared to the skeptical part. Um, as you see here in the list, I'm not going to go through it, through it point by point. You can do that yourselves when you look at the presentation later. Um, but in the end, when it was combined, it was quite clear that the teacher's perspective was strongly colored by a pragmatic and sort of step-by-step -step approach. We'll solve these issues as they, they arise, which is 
good enough in a sense, uh, but needs to be continued to develop on. Four terms on, we're pretty much in the same situation as we check with our colleagues. The flexibility is attractive, but it is also still causing unease. And online has become much more clear, especially to those who had not been exposed to it or sort of explored it much before. Uh, and this knowledge of options and possibilities has increased significantly. And for us, quite interesting that online, you know, in the broad sense, is not the eternal sort of second best choice. That there are ideas that it's, there are better, that it's, it's a better alternative in some cases, but that the campus attributes have also become much more sharper and people discuss much more actively what the actual attributes is, which was something we did not really see. And when we went into the pandemic, something that people couldn't really articulate as such at the beginning, but now has begun to coagulate much more clearly. Uh, we have to be clear, we've been doing emergency remote teaching. Um, our watchdogs in Stockholm, among other things, our quality watchdogs have already started to sort of research this. There are several pretty good reports emerging about what has happened and the, and the sort of quality effects of this. Um, and to balance this about against the sort of more strategic and planned idea of distance teaching and distance design, designed curriculum for distance teaching, which is something else, and to be very clear about that distinction. And sort of to wrap up our, our general impressions, we end up with that we have to return and continue to follow up issues about what is the quality of what we call e-learning in the end. What can we pick up and keep on moving now that we are, and we are moving back towards campus more actively, um, step by step. We can see several impacts quite clearly. Resource allocation when it comes to management, all of a sudden certain resource allocations which have become that have been quite sticky for years have suddenly become quite well lubricated, such as um, acquiring licenses, acquiring hardware, looking at venues, um, possibly going into more active training and development pro programs. That's why I asked the question to Professor Delgado earlier. Um, we have a lot left in terms of impact of teaching actively and impact of learning as such. And that's where it becomes really interesting. We see that there is a challenge in acquiring and, and finding this overall balance in the, what is blended, what is hybrid and all that. And that is where we are today. And that is where we will be working from now on. Thank you. Marta, you, Marta, you are muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Gear, for your uh, nice presentation on Uppsala experiences and look forward. Uh, we will now uh, switch to our third presentation, which is titled Rapid Large Scale Introduction of Online High Flex Hybrid Teaching Formats and Experiences from a Polish Private Multi Campus University. The presentation will be given by Lukasz Tanas and Katarzyna Kulwicka. Uh, Lukas is the head of the Center for Excellence in, in Online Learning, as well as an assistant professor in the Warsaw Campus Department of Co Cognitive Psychology. While Katrina Kulwicka is the lecturer in Wroclaw Faculty of Psychology, Department of Economics Psychology, but she is also a member of the Center for Research and Center for Excellence in Online Learning. So, Lukas and Katrina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marta. I hope you can see me and hear me and you can see the slides on full screen. I'm not sure how it looks like from the other side. As if it's not in uh, delivery mode, uh, but okay. Well, it's always the challenge to use a new software, but if it's fine, then um, unless you can guide me on where to... Um, Okay, but I think we can go. We can go with that. Okay, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, we will give you a few bullet points about our experiences at our university in this emergency uh, situation and how we adapted to that and um, what have we learned from it. To, to give you a brief overview of um, our university, um, this university is the first private university in Poland. And we have campuses in five cities. We have 10 departments and we have more than 1,000 uh, faculty members, plus I would say twice as many 
uh, people who teach uh, part time. So it's um, it's a relatively large university dispersed around several campuses. And one of the first decisions that we made when we had to transition to online learning was to completely stop all teaching for a period of time, for a period of 12 days, and to make a coherent move um, to, to, to transfer the campus to an online environment in such a way that will be relatively automatic and relatively uh, stable. Uh, not to create a situation where uh, everyone is on their own and has to make their own decision with regards to their skills and capabilities, etc. cetera. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, as, as you can see, the first semester, uh, 7,000 virtual classrooms had to be created, etc. So this is the scale of, of the, the transition. And then the lessons, the lessons learned. Well, uh, the first lesson I would say is that you really need to try to maintain a coherent and relatively centralized system. This was our decision. To uh, We were using Google tools, so we decided to follow this up to use Google Classrooms and everything that comes with that package to maintain a coherent system, which is relatively easy to use. Previously, we were using other tools such as Moodle, uh, but these were they have a higher uh, level of entry uh, for those faculty who didn't uh, who don't have any IT experience. Uh, other things to consider were uh, questions of security, for example, and maintenance uh, support, uh, confidentiality. Right. So we had we needed to have one um, company that we sign an agreement with, and we can be certain that. Um, the confidentiality is maintained. Uh, another lesson that we learned is that um, the IT enthusiasts on our campus were really helpful and they offered a lot of support, uh, but they didn't necessarily make the best large-scale decisions. Uh, it's when you're an enthusiast, when you're re really proficient in using many IT tools, when you're a fan of what might come next, virtual reality, etc., uh, you sometimes might misjudge the level of task complexity and the fact that your solutions should be applicable to everyone in a very large campus and very often um, with, with low IT skills. Uh, another thing we've learned, it's really cru crucial to create a rapid response team which has representatives from each unit. So the, 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 the fake news spread fast uh, in an online environment. Uh, very often when something goes wrong, uh, the administration is to blame or people don't know what the reason for um, some problem is and therefore the, the communication channels need to be improved. What, what came, comes out of this is that we also realize that we didn't have at our university a good internal team management software. Right? We were using, when we were meeting face-to-face -face in department meetings, et cetera, we were using emails and standard tools. And what online uh, world has shown is that you need to have an improvement in that. It's not only about classrooms, it's about team management in an online uh, systems. And also automatization is the key uh, with such a large scale task. Uh, there are many potential mistakes that an individual can make and therefore it's crucial that you minimize that to uh, how much you can. And then some advanced lessons learned. Uh, well, one thing we realized is that initially we decided, okay, let's use that opportunity, for example, to create high flex classes uh, or high sync classes. So we could have students on site and um, uh, online at the same time with cameras, with microphones, equipment, etc. And that was a good idea. We put a lot of effort in that. Uh, we, we developed many classrooms that enabled this sort of um, work. But on the other hand, um, if I were to repeat that, that I would I would say, well, we kind of forgot about the people and we remembered about the building. So there were many innovations put in the building, but in practice, much of the content was delivered by people in their homes using their own cameras, microphones, etc. So there there was a 
lack of balance in that. But what we've also learned uh, about our buildings, acoustic matters since ancient Greek theaters, and when you try to deliver content, when you try to record content, deliver content online, it turns out that uh, the level of acoustics in your rooms might not be what you would expect from that. Then you, you reveal the, the problems that, that happen. Um, in terms of exams, we've learned to accept what we can't prevent. So we, we thought about proctoring uh, and, and, and relatively complex video surveillance, et, et cetera, for a moment. And then we decided not to go, not to pursue this path, rather to focus on changing how the exams are run, to create open books exams, to change the form of examination, ra rather to trying to force uh, the existing forms of examination in an online environment. Because those forms of examinations, memory-based multiple choice tests were not good to begin with. So perhaps it's a good chance to, to change that. Then high flex, high sync, use when necessary. All of that investment in equipment is a good idea, but I would say in the long term for now, we're using that on a relatively small scale. And the last thing, faculty development. Well, you now it turned out that teaching can really be a profession which requires a lot of skill um, and professorship, professorship can be achieved there. Okay, so in terms of teaching, uh... We can I please to turn the slide? Okay, thank you. So in terms of supporting the teachers, we created um, teaching advisors positions. Uh, every campus has uh, one of the uh, advisors and we offer informal support for um, new staff members, but also uh, for those who already work at the university. And we run over 200 consultation hours. Usually uh, they uh, concern the technical support uh, on how to use uh, Google tools, uh, but also how to improve online teaching and how to coping, uh, how to cope with uh, students' non-engagement, uh, which is, uh, I guess, one of the biggest problems. Uh, and we also, it also provided multi-campus information exchange, and we can we can uh, exchange experiences. And uh, we have uh, weekly meetings when we discuss problems on each uh, campus and uh, taking the student per perspective, another slide, um, we uh, decided to ask students about their experiences and the first uh, the, and the biggest con concern was about the uh, quality of teaching in general. So they were afraid that online teaching will uh, be less effective and uh, um, less, yeah, less effective and less sufficient than the uh, uh, offline teaching. Uh, also, uh, they were concerned about the lack of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contact and interaction with uh, uh, lecturers and other students, but they also found some uh, pros about uh, online teaching, meaning uh, time flexibility and uh, easier way of cooperation in group projects. Uh, they also find the opportunity to organize guest lectures and uh, invite uh, lecturers from uh, many different universities from around the world, as well as they uh, kind of uh, upgraded the level of integration and uh, created a lot of space for uh, students' integration and staying in touch. I, I don't know if you can see it, but one of the way was uh, like to create create some kind of a group identity. One of the group decided to be Pokemons and they uh, presented uh, these uh, Mm, yeah, these uh, pictures on each classes, and they also uh, created some uh, so-called so gossip pub informal platform for like meeting and discussing everything which is not related to students. And overall, uh, they all, although we are all tired, uh, we are rather satisfied with the whole content, and yeah, and that's it. Thank you both. This was really interesting and uh, especially this part of uh, letting them uh, play a bit like children with uh, naming uh, Pokemons and all on. This is always uh, stimulating. So uh, now we have uh, finished our presentation of practices and I invite all the uh, lecturers and presenters to put their cameras on. Uh, not only the last ones, I also invite here and uh, Christos and uh, Melko. 
So uh, we will now take a few questions from our audience and uh, address them. First one goes uh, directly to Christos, and uh, the question is from Ludovica Lechte. How did you deal with the resistance of stuff? Um, well, it was way easier than it was before the pandemic. I think the uh, urgency uh, of the moment um, created this uh, understanding that uh, this needs to be done now, otherwise our students will not be able to finish their semester. So uh, this kind of psychological pressure to the faculty, I think, reduced the amount of resistance tremendously. Because, uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, we've been dealing with online learning for a few years now, uh, quite many years at the University of Nicosia. And we always had faculty who refused to teach online, didn't really want to, to use a camera, etc. So uh, I think it was not as hard as we thought it would be. And uh, I think the pressure from the students to continue their studies and be able to finish their degree was the main uh, aspect of uh, convincing the faculty that they needed to do it. Uh, uh, can I add a point here? Mm -hmm. I think what uh, played an important role in this was that the rector of the university and the vice rectors um, had an online meeting with all faculty and convince them of the importance of doing so plus also they assured them that they will have all the technical support needed to do that transition because that is what i think that what made us more afraid of this which is that oh my god how do i go online now mm -hmm. i don't have the necessary experience mm -hmm. and expertise but we had the the assurance that the technical support would be there. And actually, Christos, through his office, made everything possible to ensure that we did have it. And that is what enabled us to do that transition. Yeah. Okay. And, and, also, and, yeah. Also, Melpoy, the fact that uh, I'm, I'm like huge amount, like the, I don't know, I think more than 75% uh, of our faculty already knew how to use the software because we were offering training since 2018. Yes on all this software. So it was not a training uh, exercise that happened in a week. It was uh, just few people that were not able to use the software. Maybe they were not very competent in using the software mm -hmm. very well, but they didn't know, no, they didn't know how, the, how to use the software uh, to a certain level. Thank you. So it's about, as, as we saw from uh, a Madrid presentation, it's, it's uh, more about creating a good atmosphere mm -hmm. and the uh, kind of uh, persistent support that is available always and then people go for it it's not a problem well the next question uh is i think also for you uh it's about uh explaining your flexible learning principles so yeah i'm glad i saw the question earlier so i pulled up a table here i think you can see the table so as i mentioned since 2019 uh, we have been discussing at the university of nicosia how we can make uh, online learning uh, our uh, learning uh, in general that uh, we offer at the university more flexible my background is in uh, adult education and lifelong learning so uh, that also is my, let's say, philosophy when it comes to learning. And uh, we use the Collins and Moon uh, framework uh, on flexibility, and we try to adjust it. And I put here a table with all the elements, the dimensions, as they call them in the book. Uh, we added few. We, we removed some to fit the needs of our university. And as you can see, they are divided in different categories and then... Uh, with uh, different partners in the university, we sit down and think how we can make learning more flexible for our students when it comes to all these different categories. Um, I can share this table and uh, for with those who are interested, just send me an email and you can try to adopt that for your university. But what I mentioned in the presentation is that because we already went through the thinking process of a lot of these, it was very easy for us to to come to decisions. The decisions were made in advance because we did this exercise on how to become more flexible uh, before the pandemic. Thank you. Sharing this table would be for sure very useful for interested 
participants. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, it's from Ivre. Uh, could you tell us a little more about solutions or ideas for non-engagement of students if encountered? I, I think that this goes for everybody or who has the idea how to answer. So, uh, as we mentioned, uh, we mentioned uh, the problems when, with non-engagement in our presentation. I will allow myself to uh, to speak a little bit more. So first, we did some evidence-based practices, uh, like, like for example, educating about Zoom fatigue and uh, also lower lowering our expectation toward the fact that the cameras will be uh, will be on all of the time. So we uh, decided not to force students to keep them. To keep them on, uh, but also encourage them to uh, every single, even minor engagement, like writing on a chat in Google, uh, Google Meet, and so uh, and so on. But we also uh, used some uh, practice-based uh, uh, practices, like for example, I don't know, asking them, okay, turn off your uh, turn on your cameras and show our uh, show uh, show us our pets, uh, your pets, or something like it. So we also created created the informal but a rather friendly environment, and also we engage them. Uh, uh, in a, a small group uh, tasks during the classes uh, and yeah and basically I guess that's that's it. Maybe if I, I can add one thing I think the online environment um, showed that what's really important is having a relatively precise scenario for the class mm -hmm. what you could go away with like having a very general theme in, an, in a standard class now requires to have something for example which we have in this conference very professionally done a minute by minute scenario of who does what and when the engagement happens we cannot expect people to be engaged through 90 minutes they need to know and we need to know when the engagement happens and in what way in which form so the classes need to be really well prepared as a movie scenario almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank uh, you. I, I support completely this answer. Yes, this uh, online environment is so uh, prone to making mistakes <laughs> if you are not prepared well uh, from minute to minute and, and uh, plan A, plan B uh, parts. Yeah. May I add, um, at the University of Nicosia, we tried to do something else uh, to encourage our faculty to adopt the distance learning model. So in our distance learning model, there is not a lot happening synchronously. Uh, there is only uh, a small part of the teaching that happens synchronously because we have uh, people from different countries, different time zones. Cannot expect someone to show up at 2 a.m. his time for class. So uh, we encourage our faculty for the face-to-face -face courses, even though they had the synchronous sessions, to move some of that uh, time to more asynchronous activities in the learning management system, in other software that uh, we use. So the engagement of the students happened outside the presentation, let's say. Uh, also, uh, Professor Delgado mentioned earlier different software that encourage breakout sessions, for example. Uh, Engagely, he mentioned, it's a very good software that we are also using at the University of Nicosia, whose the default feature of that software is breakout sessions. So as soon as you log in, you don't log in as one of many participants, you log into one of the teams. So from the moment you get in class, you know, this is my team's in my table. So, but then you have to design the course differently, different activities for different tables, etc. So uh, moving the mentality of presentation to a more activity-based uh, teaching, I think, was the solution that we found uh, to make it less boring, let's say. Thank you. Yes, this is also something that we are trying to do here at Meyer University and uh, um, prepare teachers more for this unsynchronous modes of preparation for students that uh, they do on their own because they expect kind of activity. This is completely different from the classroom because uh, in online you cannot be the sage on the stage. There's no stage uh, you can uh, where you can use your uh, verbal and non-verbal skills. But it, it uh, requires really some, some completely different approach. We have another uh, question for all. Uh, could you maybe reflect on the future possibilities of the newly found flexibility in teaching and learning during the pandemic for higher education and lifelong learning in the future? It's posed by Martje Andekerk. 
Yes, Gerd, please. Just a brief observation. That is that is the big question. But, um, but generally from us, for example, the, we mentioned the word time a lot here, and time is essential. And the way that this can be unfolded into using time, teacher time, student time, um, in a more um, in inclusive way. I think that's a track that we will very much have to look at, um, the, the opportunities that are offered by this um, to see the individual students and to communicate and interact, not only with the mass, but with the individual, to find the balance there. That's something that we will very much have to reflect on and use when it comes to these the, the flexibility options. Others? Yes? Uh, well, yes. yeah. So, um, the, the main issue with, well, I think that my answer would have been uh, we're moving towards direction if it wasn't for, at least in Cyprus and Greece, we have uh, quality assurance agencies that are not convinced that this is the way forward for uh, higher education. And maybe they're, they're right. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, these are theories that need to be applied in practice um, when it comes to, to flexibility, because when you want to give uh, a student the same degree as another student, you want to make sure that uh, there is certain quality measures that even though they do different activities, they can get the, let's say the same level of education, the same quality of education, which is the biggest channel challenge when it comes to, to flexibility. Uh, to be honest, for us, it was a great exercise. Uh, the fact that we were forced to add some more flexibility and uh, we shared those the data we received uh, and we had to, with the quality assurance agencies uh, i'm not there were not major changes yet other than uh, let's say final exams are a bit a little bit different we were trying to convince them convince them that proctoring could be a solution to a synchronous exam that was in 2019, like a few months before the pandemic. And uh, they didn't really like the idea, but then a few months later, they realized that that was the only, one of the few solutions. So they let us try it. And then we sent them the data back. And uh, we are convinced that it can work. Uh, so I think uh, we are moving towards more flexibility and the other the other observation i have is that our students population are changing we see more and more people coming back to the university we don't only have 18 to uh, 22 24 year old students anymore at the universities and we don't we cannot expect this group of people to be um we need to give them the flexibility otherwise we will lose that population so I think it's uh, it's an argument that we we as higher education community need to, to think. Otherwise, we're losing this population and we're losing the opportunity to uh, further educate and uh, the people who are actually in the profession for decades, maybe without real uh, re-education or refreshing of their knowledge. Okay, I will take one more question. It's from Sandra Stolova. Uh, do you think teaching online and preparing online classes was more challenging for the teachers? If so, were any strategies for finding the teachers' work-life balance uh, in, in at your universities? If someone is willing to answer. Should I answer again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Very briefly. So, it's true. It takes more time to prepare a well done online course, but uh, after you prepare it, you may not be may not need to be there all the time. Meaning, if you design asynchronous activities for your students and uh, uh, prepare the material and nicely done uh, activities, uh, then you will need to grade them. Even though there are now software that can do it for you, if it's can goes to multiple choice questions, et cetera. So what I'm saying is that the, the initial design of a of well, well done online course, it takes time, but after you do it, you can reuse the material way easier. You can record yourself if you do a very nice recording along with your presentation. So instead of showing up for three hours every semester, you can ask your students to uh, watch that. And now there's software where you can uh, your students can comment live while you're playing it. So the technology is there for us to reduce our workload. The question is how we use it. Yes, I would agree that every change in uh, in the way you do your work, whatever it is, 
uh, it's uh, it just demands the first steps and then uh, later on you just benefit from it because it's uh, you have to change the state of mind and the way you work and then uh, everything uh, after all uh, what was my experience it's very rewarding afterwards when your students are satisfied and uh, things go well uh, one more because uh, i think everybody is waiting for the lunch break uh, lucy madantas asks uh, as we are returning from to on-site classes what do you think will remain from, from this uh, lessons learned uh, in online period? And do you think there is also a risk to come back to the previous ways of teaching and methodologies? At least at your universities, do you see this as a risk? Uh, whether you will go back or you, you will just continue the way uh, we have set up in this two years time? So, some of the some of the things the skills that people learn will stay for example uh, before uh, we had lectures that had very few things on Moodle now they tend to put every all the material in Moodle just a simple example and I think that will continue even if we go back because they realize it's way more convenient than sending emails to your students with your presentations um, so uh, what was the second part of the question was ah what if we will go I mean um, there is definitely tremendous value in face-to-face -face interaction with the students, especially when it comes to undergraduates. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we should go back uh, for the face-to-face -face classes for all these benefits yeah. students uh, have, but uh, we should stay there, I mean, if the pandemic allows it, uh, but all these uh, things that we learned from the online uh, delivery of courses, I think we should keep those that were successful, especially the use of technologies that are really effective uh, when it comes to any kind of, uh, of teaching. If I may add something, Martha, uh, we, currently at the university we are back, we are having physical on ground face to face classes, but we have kept everything that we have learned from the previous pandemic experience in that we have set up in Moodle the, the, the lecture materials, cases, discussion forums. So even if a student, for example, cannot come to class because he's sick, mm -hmm. because he's traveling for work, he or she has all the money. not have to miss anything and can still be part of the course. So there are little things like that, that we will, they will remain from us. It's positive things that we have kept mm -hmm. from this experience. And I think it's adding value to what we deliver to students. Well, thank you. Yes. For, just, for example, we, we're now using live streaming at the University of Nicosia, which was an extremely uh, expensive investment, which we would have never done if the pandemic was uh, not here. And now we have the technology to accommodate students who cannot be in class. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we can wrap up here, uh, just uh, maybe concluding that it's in the human nature that everything that works well is not discarded usually, but promoted. <laughs> so it's evolutionary path and I think there is no uh, way back in the same situation because we have evolved into something different uh, during this time that lasted, uh, hopefully will end, but uh, lasted long enough to get some really positive experiences. The ones particularly that we had the chance to be presented to us today. Thank you all very much for participating and for sharing uh, your uh, experiences from this. And I invite everybody to get a break, uh, which is a lunchtime break, and uh, see you again in the afternoon. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and the discussion. Bye-bye.